I was one of the early broadcasters of this team with Ray Geraci, if you folks remember Ray Geraci. Kind of a strange situation. Ray Geraci was the mayor of Highland Park, a Chicago suburb, but he would come down every week and do these games because Stormy Bidwell liked him. So that's why he was here. But so many memories, the Phantom Mel Gray catch, and we got a surprise for you later regarding the Mel Gray catch. Jim Otis ramming the ball down the Redskins' throats in overtime, and Jim Hart, or Jimmy Bakken kicking the winning field goal. Terry Metcalf doing inhuman things with his body, returning kicks and receptions. And Jackie Smith, you're not tackling my ass. <laughs> After catching a hard pass and carrying half the Dallas Cowboys into the end zone. Probably the best offensive line in NFL history, setting a record for the fewest sacks. Jimmy Hart's here tonight. He didn't even get his uniform dirty one season. <laughs> that offensive line was so good. Don Coriel being paranoid during Redskins week. He'd hire off-duty policemen to patrol the top of Bush Stadium with binoculars to make sure that George Allen and wh whoever was not watching practice. With those of us in the media, we'd come for the post-practice interviews. We'd have to set our cameras on the ground because Coriel was afraid that, you know, like we were smart enough in the media to know what the hell they were practicing and we were going we to tell Alan about it. But he was absolutely paranoid about it. There were some funny times, too. Bill, Bill, Bill Bidwell loved to fool the media. He did it with a couple of coaches. Now, when he hired Don Coriel, we had never heard of Coriel. It was a stroke of genius. But there was another time he was naming a new head coach, and I came up for the news conference at the old Bel Air Hilton downtown. I got on the elevator to go downstairs in the, in the room. There was one other person on the elevator, and it was Bill Bidwell. He looked at me and smiled and said, I got you again. He proceeded to name Bud Wilkinson the head coach of the football Cardinals. Uh, Wilkinson was a legendary Oklahoma coach in college. He had not coached in 17 years and never in the NFL. That was not a stroke of genius. I remember the final regular season game in 1984, December 16th. I was standing behind the bench at RFK Stadium. Cardinals are losing to the Redskins 29-27 with time running out. If they win the game, they win the division. Neil O'Donohue ran onto the field. They couldn't stop the clock. They ran out of timeouts. His field goal sailed wide. I'd lost by two, 29-27. I still have the image of linebacker E.J. Jr. on his knees, pounding the turf with his fist in frustration over that loss. Finally, there was what I call the boonies, some of George Boone's draft choices. 1978, second round pick out of Texas A&M Kingsville, linebacker Johnny Bearfield. Bearfield held out, he thought he was so good. I was at Lambert Field covering his arrival. He got off the plane with a quarter in his ear. He said, I am the 25th wonder of the world. He played three seasons here. I was here for three seasons. Played in eight games. Couldn't play a lick. A year before, first round pick. Now, Don Coriel was not allowed in the draft room in those days by Mr. Bidwell for some reason. And those of us had gathered in Joe Pollock's office in the media waiting for the announcement of the Cardinals' first round pick. George Boone comes in, Coriel's pacing the halls outside. He had a great offense. He needed defensive people. George Boone clears his voice and says, <clears throat> with the Cardinals' first-round pick, St. Louis football Cardinals select quarterback Steve Pizarkowitz from the University of Missouri. According to Yahoo Sports, it was one of the 20th worth first-round picks in NFL history. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making that up. I looked it up. One of the 20th worst first-round picks in NFL history. The saddest memory for me was being in Phoenix at the news conference when the NFL officially announced the Big Red was moving there. The governor of Arizona was there. The NFL commissioner was there. Big dog and pony show. Bill Bidwell was on the podium. They were all taking questions. Eventually, I asked Bill if he had anything to say to the loyal St. Louis Rams, or St. Louis fans, excuse me, Little fupa there, St. Louis fans. Bill Bidwell's mouth opened, nothing came out. He couldn't talk. His eyes welled up in tears. He did not want to do that. 
I am totally convinced he did not want to move the team, but he felt disrespected by the city. He felt like a second-class citizen. He needed the stadium. Ironically, when they built the dome, we called him in Arizona. So what do you, what's your reaction? He said this would not have had to be a long-distance phone call. So that's one of the sad moments for me. But enough for me. It's time to meet our legends tonight. So here we go. Number 72, Dan Deardorff. Nineteen seventy one second round draft pick out of Michigan, generally considered one of the best offensive tackles in NFL history. College Football Hall of Fame. In the NFL Hall of Fame twice. Once as a broadcaster and of course once as a player. Stable on Monday night football telecasts for years with Al Michaels and Frank Gifford. Dan Anchor, the offensive line that led the NFL for three years, the NFC for five years with the fewest quarterback sacks. In fact, Dan did not allow a single sex for two consecutive seasons. Dan Deardorff. Next, the man that Dan at the offensive line protected during those cardiac cardinal years. Number 17, Jim Hart. It's a Saluki, SIU Carbondale, the quarterback on a not a very good football team. Undrafted, but came, was invited to the Big Red training camp, and perhaps after a while he'll explain how that happened. There were six quarterbacks in camp when he was a rookie. Jim was number six. But he played 18 years in the NFL, 17 with the Cardinals, passed for 34,639 yards, 209 touchdowns, the NFC Player of the Year 1974, this man completed 2,593 passes. He belongs in the NFL Hall of Fame, but they don't seem to appreciate it. Jimmy Hurt. He won number 22, but when it came to ranking quarterbacks, Roger Worley was number one. A consensus, consensus All-American in Missouri, Roger was the Big 8 Defensive Player of the Year. He played 14 seasons in the NFL with the Big Red. He was a seven-time Pro Bowl selection. Quarterback Roger Staubach said that Roger Worley was the best cornerback he ever played against. Shutdown cornerback described him very well. He had 40 career interceptions, but it would have been a lot more because, to tell you the truth, quarterbacks avoided throwing to his side of the field. He was that good. College Football Hall of Fame in 2007. And then, of course, the NFL Hall of Fame. Hall of Famer Roger Worley. There and then there's the one I just call 81. Jackie Smith. Look at that, huh? <laughs> You know, he won, a, he, won, <laughs> he won the state high hurdle championship in Louisiana when he was in high school, so he just proved it again. He, Jackie started out in high school playing the clarinet in the band. It's a true story. But he decided as a sophomore, he decided as a sophomore to go out for football. This is high school. But because of a seri series of injuries, he only played in five high school games. But he excelled in track. As I said, he won the state high hurdles championship. Got a track scholarship from Northwestern Louisiana State, but he also had to play football so they could give him a full scholarship, I understand. He was a 16th round draft choice of the Big Red in 1983, I believe it was. S 73. What year? 70. 53. <laughs> 43. The second game of his rookie, 
He doesn't remember, neither do I. Second game of the season. He had nine catches, 212 yards, and two TDs, and his career was underway. Jackie Smith changed the position of tight end forever in the NFL. He was an offensive weapon. 15 years later when he retired, he had 480 receptions, almost 8,000 yards, and 40 touchdowns. In 1994, Jackie walked through the, the doors at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Jackie Smith. And then there's the man we simply call Coach or Henny. It may surprise you to learn that at the University of California, Jim Hannafin led the nation in receiving one season. Hannafin spent about 30 years coaching in the NFL in various capacities, six years as the Big Reds head coach. Many regard him as the best offensive line coach in NFL history. And if those who run the NFL Hall of Fame ever realize the value of assistant coaches, Jim Hannafin should be the first one to walk through the doors at Canton. Hanny can make the long walk over here. When he coached the, uh, the Big Red for a number of years, one of the funny stories, I guess it's funny now, probably wasn't at the time, he found out that Bidwell had fired him when they changed the lock on his office door at halftime of the last game. <laughs> That's a true story. Ladies and gentlemen, the new legends of football in St. Louis.